There we go. Here's our last chapter. And um, before I even started reading the chapter, I was a little put off by the title. So I wanted to ask the question, don't you think it's a little harsh <laughs> to say, oh, what was the words again? Does God have a future? What did you guys think about that? Is it fair to say that God does not have a future? Anybody have any like initial thoughts on that? Well, since God does not have time, uh, he cannot have a future. Ah, there we go. There's a philosophical answer. I like it. Well, you know, it is interesting that pretty much every group of people in the world have considered themselves, you know, in end times. You know, I mean, the original name of our church was Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So everybody who's ever lived on this earth seems to think that Christ is going to come back during our time frame. So I thought that was kind of interesting. It's not really new that we think we're living in end times. But uh, Karen Armstrong points out she didn't use COVID. She used AIDS as her as her plague, you know, and, and luckily we've gotten some good control on AIDS and I'm, I'm hopeful that we can get some good control on COVID, but it is interesting that these plagues are popping up on us. You know, I would have never thought I'd lived in a time where there was a plague. You know, that word is always just a very historical word for me. And then, of course, we have the global warming issues. And um, I have talked to a lot of young adults about the population issue, you know, that there is a lot of concern about whether the planet can, can, can sustain the population that keeps increasing on this earth and what do we do about it? So these are all kind of issues to consider when we're thinking of the end times. It's a little morbid, but um, it does come into play with uh, what people believe in terms of their own religion and in, and just in God in particular, you know, I mean, do you guys see this not necessarily with our church friends? Cause I think that those of us who just, who choose to go to church and, and study and, you know, and uh, worship the way we do, we are still looking for that hope, but I'm just kind of wondering with coworkers and neighbors, you know, I would say, I don't think any of my neighbors go to church. So I haven't had that. I've never asked him that question. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to, but I was wondering if you got the sense from some of the people around you, whether they thought, you know, in, in, in all sense, it, it, it's kind of like God is dead to them. They don't need God kind of a thing. Is there, is there any of that that you hear? Hello, this is Paul Jane. Can you hear me? Yeah, speak up just a little more. I, I don't know that I hear that so much as I hear people saying, uh, I don't need to go to church to be spiritual. I can find spiritual um, wholeness and spiritual events in my life without religion or, or necessarily including God. Uh, I don't, I mean, other than people that are diehard atheists, uh, you know, the Richard Dawkins and Michael Shermer and some of the others that, that you see on TV once in a while. Yeah. I, I don't personally hear a lot of people saying that. And I think, you know, as far as the, your first question, the future of God, um, you know, is God, what was it, is God going to continue to exist or something along those lines? I think that that presumes the non-existence of God for me. And so what, what she's asking is, uh, are we ourselves, are people going to allow God to continue to exist as if God is, is just an idea? Um, so, so I think that sort of presumes a, a position that a lot of people sitting here in Sunday school or in church may not, you know, um, relate to very well. 
And then the other part, the end times part, I don't really, I, I mean, every time has been a potential end time for this world. Uh, and we've studied world, you know, world religions and world history and all of that. So we've kind of seen that. And it's no different today. I don't necessarily believe that, I, I don't really believe in end times in the eschatological sense. Um, I do think it's entirely possible that we could make our species extinct if we're not careful, whether through atomic warfare or uh, making the planet uninhabitable. Um, so, so I think we have some control over that. I think that's the great existential question for me is, uh, is humanity going to grow up in time and prevent us from extinct? Well, yeah, so I'm hearing you say, and I do agree that maybe it's not, the better question is, is, is religion dead, you know, because this next, this next question intrigued me, when religious ideas cease to become effective, they fade away, and I do think that, you know, in terms of some of our traditional um, religion, and this is, of course, we've talked about it for years now. This is what our own church struggles with. You know, when people people don't feel the need to come to a Sunday morning service or you know Sunday school class like this. You know, they they can get their spirituality or they find it other places, and so it's just it's a real challenge for the churches not to not to fade away generally. And then, of course. We also need to look at the religious ideas, even in our own church, but really from the beginning of Christianity on, how many religious ideas have just kind of faded away because humanity just just doesn't buy it anymore. You know, that's kind of how that's kind of how I look at it. There's we'll, we'll see later in our chapter that we still we have our fundamentalists who are who are kind of reviving all of the old beliefs and very, very strong about, you know, the literal interpretation of the Bible. But, you know, as we know, and as have we, as we have discussed, there are certain beliefs that perhaps aren't effective for us anymore. So we don't, so we don't, you know, use that particular, um, well, you know, obviously the examples in our own church are, you know, they, I don't know if you know this, Marilyn, but we actually had baptism for the dead in our own church. And, and we had to have a big meeting a long time ago. It's before my time. They had a big meeting to just put it in the back of the, of the um, doctrine and covenants because it wasn't effective anymore. We decided, no, that's not inspired. So Evolve, churches evolve and people <clears throat> and people evolve. So. Well, Jane, this is Nadine. Um, I learned a concept um, and I don't, I didn't get to read the chapter, so you'll have to let me know if I'm stepping on something that, but the concept of God and the gap. And that's kind of what you're describing when, when it isn't effective anymore. It's because humans have figured something out and they don't, put that onto God having given that to him in the like miraculous sense. Um, obviously, you know, nature and all that, I believe was God given kind of as it were. But um, as people get smarter and understand things, they go, oh, okay, we don't, we don't need to put that on a, on a higher being. Um, I also think um, totally different fundamentalists are, are being kind of encouraged to believe this is in time. And there's a lot of them doing practical things right now, like financing Israel and, you know, different things like that, because they really truly believe that. Absolutely. Well, you actually are right on track, Nadine, because that issue of the gap, it's all about this scientific age. Right. And yes, and so... Yeah, she talked about that, that our secularists, you know, I mean, it is interesting. She used the word secular, secular, can't say it, secularist, act a little separately than atheism, because I actually think secularists, <laughs> sorry, are in every walk of, of uh, you know, of our country. I mean, it, it's, it's going to be religious people and atheists. 
But what, what secularists think is that atheism may be the irre irreversible condition of humanity in the scientific age. I, I disagree <laughs> with that statement. Let me just put it out there right now. But I, it, it, her proof is kind of interesting. I, I have been to Europe and a lot of you guys have been to Europe and I'm pretty sure church is dead in Europe. You know, I mean, the only time I ever saw anybody go to church was in Finland when they had confirmations for their kids. And um, I Germany, church they were, yeah. churches are empty, you know. That was something Avis always said. Yeah. That when she lived in England. That That's right. There were pockets of it. There's little pockets of, of churches that, but the big, it just, the movement is kind of gone there. And even here, you know, I, I pointed out that we've got the phenomenon in America that if the young adult doesn't have kids, you know, I think it's rare to see them in church. It's when they get those kids that they start thinking about baptism and confirmation and, and you know, what am I, how am I going to rear my child? It's that, it's that issue of God isn't dead. I just have to figure out what to do with church with my kids you know? And so this, this question then is, is it, is it an automatic response? It's kind of like what Nadine was saying in a secular society, we, we do we first say, okay, we can explain that through science or some natural cause rather than, you know, it has to be, everything has to be from God, you know, which was, which was the, you know, in the beginning of, of religion, everything is explained by God. And I thought it was interesting that some people, <laughs> well, and I have to say that I am feeling a little bit liberated, not from God, but from the religious, the religious terror <laughs> that my own, my own upbringing kind of gave me, you know, I mean, man, there's some, there's some harsh stuff in the Bible about, if you don't believe you're going to hell and, and, um, you know, I I do I think God is bigger than the Bible. That's how I that's how I explain it. I don't say I'm liberated from God. I say I'm liberated from some of the you know the beliefs that were that were kind of put there to put to uh, to keep the keep the people down. You know, that's that's definitely what the history of Christianity has done. We're going to tell you what to do, and if you don't do it, then you're going to hell, you know. Jane, so, Jane yeah. um, I think part of it also, and I had to sign off for a couple minutes and come back in because I lost everybody. But so you may have said something about this, but I think a lot of it is just people are tired. They, you know, run, run, run during their work week. Then they have Saturday that's filled with, with stuff that they've got to do. And so Sunday just becomes a day that they don't want to get out of bed. They want yeah. to sleep. And, you know, it, it may not be that, that they necessarily don't believe in God. It's just they feel like there's not a, a necessity to get up and get out and put their best foot, you know, clothes on and go do something that they often feel doesn't touch them because they don't feel like some of the sermons and stuff are relevant rele yeah, relevant to their lives yeah. and so I think people just give up on it and say well yeah and Sunday is no longer a sacred day you know it's filled with sports you know here and there and and um, you know everything's open so there's you know there's no reason to to be in one place because they can be in a lot of places. Yeah. So I think there's several other things besides the belief system that, you know, impact it too. Yeah. Priorities have really changed. I mean, I think you're right. I think Sunday is a day for, you know, even more so than Saturday for them to unplug and rest, you know, Saturday is their day to get their errands done and, and Sunday is the day that they get to just have a cup of coffee at, you know, when they get up. And I do think that that is a very common routine in our country right now. 
you know, but then then um, Karen Armstrong talks about the flip side of the issue. Do these people when you when you don't have like a regular, I would say a regular um, community spiritual life, do these people have a sinking feeling that they are losing integrity? I mean, I think that's that's kind of an interest, interesting question for those people who do choose to unplug. You know, I mean, is it enough? Um, is it enough to go to a podcast, for instance? Is it enough to just read your Bible or or journal yourself and not have community? Is is my question. People losing. I think that's one of the reasons that depression has, you know has hit so many people because they don't have that support system and they don't know how to reach out for what they need. Yeah. So they just, you know, go inside and pretty soon they have nobody. They're, they're alone. Yeah. Jane, I think Paul had a comment. Okay, Paul. I, you know, the question for me is, are, are people losing integrity or is it the church has lost its credibility? And I think a lot of that has turned people away from religion. Um, and in response to your first question about are we headed the way of Europe? Yes, absolutely we are. In another 50 or 20, you know, 100 years, the United States will probably have uh, church attendance the same as what Europe does. And, and actually, we may be coming back full circle in Christianity to, to, to home church again. That's what Christianity started with. And that may be where we'll be in the next 10 or 20 years as community of Christ. You know, who, who knows? Um, and then I had one other comment on your question or your statement about um, the, the scientific age uh, and, and being a stimulus for atheism. And my comment is if, if the only reason that people need God and people need scripture is to explain the universe, then they deserve to become atheists. Okay. <laughs> God is so, you know, different. I, I don't, Try to mix God and, and science uh, together. I I look at the wonder and the beauty and the majesty and the, the miracle that you know is this earth and the fact that we're even here and that we have each other and that I find all kinds of reasons to be optimistic about God. I could care less whether God could make an antibiotic or not. That's the realm of science and, and medicine. And, you know, let's yeah. not confuse the two. Yeah. Yeah, and I I, I agree and and I think it. It's interesting that she she talks about this as a secularist, but then but then uh, we'll talk later about it. Really, there's been kind of a resurgence of the mysticism because I do think a lot of us, it, you know, are saying there it isn't about you know science versus God. It's it's about the um, human experience that science can't touch. You know that that uh, you, you can't explain emotions and, and um, actions and, and what we all feel and believe. That's something, that's something for religion. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Jane, just yeah. to, you know, it, it seems to me that uh, people, if the church is not meeting the needs of people and they're still believing in God, then it seems like that's an easy route to simply saying you're spiritual. It's an easy what? To saying that you are spiritual. Yeah. You're, you know, you believe in the spirit uh, of creation. You believe in God, but you don't need the church because the church is not meeting your needs. So I think the real challenge is how do we make it so that every Sunday we meet the needs of the people? Yeah, that's a tricky one. And, and that's kind of my job in the next year or two. And I've been, I've been really contemplating and praying about it. And um, I don't know if you guys remember this, but I've kind of been going back to this exercise that we did years and years ago about how different people worship, you know, um, I'm, I'm more of a mystical type of a worshiper. Other people, uh, you know, are intellectual worshipers. Heart, you know, it's like, I remember that test we all took, you know, as heart, head, hands. And I thought about getting that back out because I thought, you know, one service is, is it's a tall task for one Sunday morning service to reach everybody's, you know, viewpoint of, of spirituality. 
because every, we all worship a little bit differently. So that that's something as leaders, when we're well, those of us planning services, that's something I think we need to be very aware of. You know, it's like, okay, what is my focus this week? What is my target audience this week? And make it very clear what we're what we're how we're going to worship this week, you know, because we worship differently. So that's a really good point. All right, here's our existentialists. I went ahead and put the definition up because I've 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 personally kind of messed up the definition in the past. So these are people who emphasize the existence of the individual as a free and responsible agent to determine their own development, okay? So Jean-Paul Sartre spoke of the God-shaped hole in the human consciousness where God had always been. He thought we, we should reject God if he existed because God negates our freedom. That's that whole question I asked earlier is it, is it you know if, if in the scientific age are we kind of shaking off the uh, rules that we thought God had you know for us is that a good thing and um, he did he rejected traditional religion telling us that we must conform to God's idea of humanity to become fully human and that um, we must see ourselves as liberty incarnate. So he's like freeing the human being. <laughs> but that was kind of interesting. <laughs> so, you know, these guys, this guy Merlo Ponty also said that, that God negates our sense of wonder. God, rep God represents absolute perfection. So there is nothing left for us to do or achieve. You know, it's a, it's, it's almost like, he, he, he takes away in, in this guy's mind, he takes away from our, our own, you know, liberty to, to, you know, develop and, and to become better human beings. And then they, they, she calls Albert Camus, the heroic atheist. <laughs> People should reject God defiantly in, in order to pour out all their loving solicitude upon mankind. So perhaps Camus is saying that we are, if we you know, focus so much on worshiping God, then we're not, we're not actually helping our neighbors and humankind as much because we're, you know, I, I would say there are a lot of people that, that it, it's more important for them to, to, uh, to pray and to go to church and to, you know, to show that they are very religious rather than just to get out and help people. You know, I mean, there is a balance that we as Christians need to be aware of, you know, so I don't agree with these guys, but I, I understand what, what, how people get there, you know, Any comments on that. Is this Christ said, uh, love your God with all your heart, mind and strength and your neighbor is yourself. Right. And there's the two most important rules. And a lot of people forget to balance them. They need to be balanced. So it's an, it's an interesting question that people have thought that they that too much emphasis has put been put on God. So then the logical positivists come around and these are the guys who um, they consider only meaningful ph philosophical problems that can be solved by logical analysis. I, I presume there's some lawyers in this group. Um, so this guy Ayers said that natural sciences provided the only reliable source of knowledge because it could be tested empirically. And he went through this, um, th this whole, everything is about empirical testing. And ironically, he thinks that the simple belief, I believe in God, is verifiable, but after death. <laughs> so I guess, I guess, you know, it's not verifiable in our, for us, but, you know, that's a very simple belief that, you know, if you, you, we just say, I believe, it's like, okay. And then when you die, you find out if you're right or wrong. But it's the more complex 
belief systems that he rejected, you know, and he even rejected atheism too, because he said, how in the world can you say there is a God or, or isn't a God or these big concepts that we have to believe or deny when there's nothing to test it on, you know? So he believed that religious beliefs represented an immaturity, which science would overcome. That's what Freud said too. So do we still have a lot of logical positivists in our world today? Do you think in our, do our scientists think that way? Um. Um, <laughs> you scientists and doctors and things, it, do, do some people say that it's kind of naive to believe, to have all of these religious beliefs? And some of our greatest scientists are. Uh, I can't hear you. Some, of, some, many of our greatest scientists are very spiritual and believe in God. Einstein, I believe Stephen Hawking. Uh, Hawking was an atheist. Was he? Yeah. Not Hawking, yeah, not Hawking. I'm definitely. And. Um, I. Einstein was mystic had had some interest in mysticism, but he also said that science and God should be completely separated, which I thought was kind of interesting. It, it may surprise you that scientists don't sit around talking about God most of the time, James. <laughs> usually involved in what their experiments are or what theories that they're pursuing or something yeah. like that. I, I don't, I, I mean, I work with a lot of uh, people who are far more intelligent than I'll ever hope to be at KU Med and I don't hear, you know, people don't sit around the operating room talking about God or yeah, know. you guys are kind of busy. Yeah. <laughs> so many, many, many of the doctors that I work with, uh, Christian, Jewish, uh, uh, Muslim, uh, you know, they're all faithful. They go to their church or synagogue or um, um, mosque. mosque. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, they, they, they have that in their life. Um, the guy who is the head of NIH, I'm trying to think of what his name is. Um, is a very active Christian. Uh, he's, he's the top scientist in the United States um, who is responsible for giving out uh, funds for medical research, all kinds of research, but medical research. And uh, he's, he's a very devout Christian. Oh, I would like to tell you guys that my surgeon uh, visited me in the hospital when I had this book on my table. And uh, Last week when I visited him, he brought it up and he said, I tried to read that book of yours <laughs> and he totally disagreed with it because he doesn't like Karen Armstrong and he wanted to talk about his book of reading a, uh, a scripture a day for a year. <laughs> so I thought that was really interesting that he kind of rejected this lady who is I mean, we're still not exactly sure what her belief systems are, but I think that I think when he started reading her, he he didn't want to go there in terms of religion. So so I found out he was very religious. Yeah. So I just thought that was interesting. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting that we've gone through the whole book and we still don't have any good idea what God is. <laughs> Well, it's all about what we decide ourselves, isn't it? It's a uh, well. I think this book has. Sorry. Go ahead, Marilyn. I was just going to say for Jeremy, maybe that's the answer. Maybe maybe we've never known what God really is. Yeah. We still don't. I, I, I think this book has taught me that the idea of God has evolved over time, depending on what's going on. Even though we think we knew historically what people believe this has given me a better idea of how that has happened, especially with philosophers and, you know, scientists and mathematicians and all of that. I think this has really been, as much as I hate trying to decipher what exactly she's saying, I really learned a lot from this book. It's just hard to, to get it out of her. I wish she wrote a little bit different. I wish she wrote more organized. Well, that's yeah. what I was going to say. She needed a better editor. My, I, yeah. I kept thinking in my chapter, it's like I could have edited this thing better than whoever yes. edited it. Yes. You know? So I don't think her book was written for the common person. I think she was writing for other scholars who 
had some basis of knowledge that we probably didn't bring to the table when we right. Hmm. I, I I agree with you, Paul. I think this was written for somebody that was working on their master's in philosophy or something. Exactly. Or this was her failed dis dissertation. That's, that's what I thought. This was her failed dissertation because it was so unorganized. Really? <laughs> she, she, her dissertation, I think, was on uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson. Oh, okay. If I remember that. Oh. I think oh. that when she failed at that, that's when she kind of turned to the religious. Well, that's just <laughs> yeah, that's a straight story. line. So. <laughs> that was interesting. Yeah, loving God. Yeah, she, I, she, I, she'd be an interesting person to talk to. She's got a lot of, a lot of avenues that have yeah. been her life. Yeah, she, she definitely has a lot of knowledge. That's for sure. Cool. Bubble. Okay, so here's our linguistic philosophers who come along and they're looking at language itself and the relationship between language and the world. And they're, they're criticizing errors because I thought this was kind of funny. His, his verification principle could not be verified. <laughs> so, so, you know, you can't, ver one thing I thought of when I read this was, well, yeah, you really, we can't verify I mean, I don't, I don't think anybody's figured it out yet, even though there are some movies that say that there has, but you, we can't verify there is a God because only the people who die know, you know, you know? and so there, the science, the, the linguistics uh, philosopher said science can only explain the world of physical nature, and this is where the scientists are recognizing the distinctions, you know, between like this guy, uh, Wilford Cantrell Smith, is saying that the world of science and hu humanity are disjointed. So you can't, you can't have any kind of empirical proof for human experience, you know? So when you're looking at religion, poetry, and music, those are all hu you know, human experiences that, that we subjectively feel and talk about, and there's no verification test for it. Um, so this guy, Anthony Flew, was saying that it is more rational to find a, a, a natural solution, but he didn't agonize over the split between science and religion. Um, so the questions that come up on this is, does science threaten the people who read the Bible literally? And, you know, I think that our own study of religion has said in the past, a lot of religious leaders have tried to kind of suppress the, you know, scientific um, viewpoints and any viewpoint that is different from the Bible. And I, I think that that some people still have that struggle. You know, if you're going to read the Bible literally, then there are problems, you know, like obviously the creation story is one of the problems that um, you have to you have to reconcile, and some people cannot reconcile that. I, it's hard I, to fit the dinosaurs in the last six thousand years. Exactly. Not when you have evidence. I, I think absolutely it threatens people who take the Bible literally, um, and, and there are apologists who have tried to explain their Bible beliefs in terms of. Uh, what I would call pseudoscience, which is not not science the way that we understand uh, the world, but it's an aberration that they have created to make it fit their beliefs. And you can't um, you can't take your beliefs and make science fit your beliefs. You have to do the science and then adjust your beliefs to match what you've what you've learned. So they're doing it backwards. But there's that guy in Kentucky that built you know whatever it is, dinosaur world or ark world, and I think he's the one that uh, postulated were uh, T Rexes on the earth. Uh, wouldn't have been good for the bunnies if that had been the case. <laughs> or the people. Or the people, yeah. yeah. He also became bankrupt, I believe. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I missed the last part of it, Paul. My dog was barking. Oh, I, I just I was talking about that guy in Kentucky that built that theme park, uh, the Bible theme park where he had the dinosaurs on the ark. Have you heard about oh. him? 
Nadine no. said he went bankrupt, and I just said he should. <laughs> Dinosaurs on the ark. Missed that part of the story. <laughs> well, I, I do like that Karen Armstrong pointed out that our scientists and philosophers who are saying that, you know, God isn't the first cause of, of these natural events are actually in line of, of in line with what what Christianity um, developed in the Middle Ages, you know, where they were that's when they were debating the objective God versus the subjective God and that there was a lot of um, uh that God could not be located in the physical universe. It was all symbolic and it, and it was okay to take things, you know, metaphorically. And that's kind of like Buddhist Nirvana to not take things so literally. So I find it kind of fascinating that as we look at the history of these religions, there's been some ebbs and flows on, you know, these issues because, because, they've always been sort of grappling whether whether you know god is that is the absolute is god personal it, can we look objectively at um the world that god created it versus this metaphor that um so really truly scholars and religious people like us have been grappling with the same issues over and over again, and I, I kind of agree with Jeremy. You know, it's like the answer is I don't know. <laughs> you know, it could. There's, it's a combination of things, and I think each one of us need to kind of figure out what it, what God is, and what it mean, what this means to our, uh, to us. Jane. Yeah. yeah. Jane, I have something to add. Um, you know, concepts of God have, have been something that humans have struggled with since the beginning of time. And, and you have everything from God created the universe and set it in motion and then just walked away to the people that think that God has a plan and he told them what to eat for breakfast this morning. Right. <laughs> and, and then everything in between. And I feel like there's kind of a shift going on right now that people are kind of reevaluating how does God work? <laughs> um, you know, and, and when we have disasters or wars or whatnot, I'm always, there's always someone on TV going, why did God let that happen? Mm -hmm. And I guess I was always raised with the thought, well, why did all of us people let it happen? Um, you know, so how much is God in control and how much is the knowledge and intelligence that God gave us supposed to be working in the world. Also, I, I don't like this idea that God's supposed to take care of everything. I think we're supposed to be struggling to take care of things mm -hmm. as much as we can. That, that's a good segue to this next slide because World War II did a real number on the theologians and philosophers, you know, because that whole God is omnipotent um, theory took a hit, you know, because you can't look at the Holocaust and, and even, you know, the Hiroshima bombing and say, you know, God is in control, you know, and so these, we have the, of course, the 60s were pretty radical anyway, but we've got these radical theologians in the 60s that they're the ones that are saying we are, we are in a, the dark night of our soul we've kind of been abandoned by god because of all of these events but you know like thomas alt altizer was saying that that we need this silence i kind of liked this we need this silence this dark night of the soul so that we can you know so god could become meaningful again so so once again it's not god you know separate being it's God the concept of how human beings are looking at it and he thought that all our old conceptions of divinity had to die in order for us to figure out a new meaning for God um 
Paul Van Buren said that science and technology had made the old way of speaking of God impossible. He thought the old mythology was invalid, but I thought it was interesting that he 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 was willing to give up on the the, the old man in the sky God, you know the you know that that traditional father figure, but he held on to Jesus of Nazareth, the man who was who he thought was the lit, the liberator for us because he defines what it means to be a man. So this is, this is, you know, even though we're, they're kind of talking about the death of God, they're also talking about the resurrection, the resurrection of God in their minds. They're not giving up on it, you know, and this is, this is in the sixties. Um, and then this guy, William Hamilton compared to what was happening in America to Luther's protest in, for Protest, Protestantism, Protestantism. Protestantism. Right. So he, you know, that, you know, Luther walked away from the sacred place where God used to be and um, found the man Jesus in, 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 I think it was actually Hamilton that said that, that you, you can walk away from where God used to be and you can still find the man Jesus in your neighbor, you know, and so that's kind of parallel with what Luther did. He wasn't walking away from his religion. He was trying to reform it and to make it more personal um, for the individual. So my question, you know, kind of to myself, so I wrote it down, is the, are these guys aren't really talking about atheism. They're, they're, they're talking about an enlightened version of Christianity. Do you guys agree with me on that? They're kind of just rethinking you know, who Jesus is and what Christianity should look like. This sounds more like the Unitarian viewpoint. That yeah, they, yeah, that's true, because it's Jesus the man, yeah. yeah but they uh, focus more on the humanity of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. I guess I've always liked that. I, I think Christianity should have more of that. <laughs> so then... Go ahead, Arlene. We can relate to Jesus where we can't really relate totally to God because yeah. he is so, so big. <laughs> yeah, he's kind of that 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 ideal, you know, that that is maybe it is attainable, number one. He was a human, so maybe it's possible for us to learn from him. Um, so then, you know, this is the 60s and, you know, there's a lot of turmoil going on, of course. So we have the, the black white issue and this guy, <laughs> and this black theologian named James Cone said, okay, white people, how, how come you get to say that uh, we are now, we have freedom from the death, you know, with the death of God, when you were the ones that enslaved our people in the name of God. So there was you know, they were kind of pointing out some hypocrisy there and, and the white affluent theologians that were talking about the death of God. So I thought that was interesting. So then we've got the, the Jewish theologian who was trying to grapple with what the Holocaust meant. Um, and he did move towards um, mysticism that and and this this concept uh, somebody might have to pronounce it for me Sintsum, is that what it is by written by a guy named Isaac Luria so god god has voluntarily estranged himself from the world and and i think that that's how mr rubenstein was able to kind of get his head wrapped around the holocaust you know if you see god as nothingness and and he is so separate from the world then it's the mystic that can kind of imagine you know god back into existence with your own human experiences that's how i understood that did it did did somebody understand it differently uh, that's you're right on rabbi luria was the one uh, i talked about you might have still been on some heavy medication back then a few weeks ago <laughs> 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 Probably. <laughs> but, but he was the one that um, kind of brought into uh, forefront the, the idea, the Jewish idea of the world as a broken place. 
as broken pottery and, and the role of humanity uh, in working with God to repair it, put it back together. Yes. Reminds me a little bit of what Sharon said a few minutes ago. Yeah, that's right. That broken pot, I do have a vague memory of that. That, that, broken, that was yeah. Rabbi Maria. Yeah, and I think, I think the Jewish people, you know, I mean, when you have that kind of horror, you know, the, the question is, where was God, you know, and it, it, it makes perfect sense that they, that they have this type of a viewpoint, you know, because, you know, God didn't let it happen, God, God didn't make it happen, and so mm. it's really, it was really a pretty big shift for them. Jane? Yeah. Uh, I thought it was interesting. One thing about that Rubenstein was uh, we've talked in the last couple of chapters about God is nothing, but I like the way he took that nothing and he split it into instead of nothing as no thing. Oh. Yeah. So it's kind of like if he said no thing, then it's he's not there. He, 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 it's almost like it's like what was saying earlier. There's the atheists and the people who believe in God are both wrong because there is no thing. A little bit disconcerting, but that's that's where they're going now. Well, God is a spirit. It's not a material thing. So in that way, it is no thing. Right. Um, I also oh. want to mention that there was the Armenian genocide back in the uh, late teens and so forth, uh, which was sort of precursor to the uh, Jewish Holocaust. That's right. And uh, so uh, Holocaust was not the first of these, uh, but it was just a little bit larger. Oh, yeah. Well, and even then, history has a lot of holocausts in it, unfortunately. So, mm -hmm. Plus, yeah. you can talk about, I mean... There was the genocide of the Holocaust, but in America, we were practicing genocide on the uh, Native Americans. Oh, yeah. It, it, it gave me shivers that the Nazis came to America in order to, to study how Americans treated Blacks in order to go back to Germany to figure out how to treat the Jews. They learned from us in yes. some of the things. Yeah, you know, like, that, that was really, really sad. Isn't that scary? Yes. Yeah. We forget that in our American history books. Well, colonization, even going long way back, was very much of a, a horrible thing to treat people. Um, and we've been, our human race has done that for a very long time. Yeah. Well, Blacks were not human to them, but that's that's what... That's what unfortunately started it. They were animals. Western so. civilization and their colonies, they got that of all the natives of, of the lands they conquered. Yeah. Well, we had the, the genocide in, was it Bosnia Herzegovina, the Muslim genocide? Yeah, the a couple one in Africa. Ago, I think that was the Christians pulling that one off. Yeah. No, not, there's, a, there's a lot of Christians that. Uh, oh. Kind of, and unfortunately, a lot of it was because they looked at the Bible, <laughs> too. So, but she also mentioned that in Africa we had the Christian um, Hutus. Hutus killing the Christian Tutsis. Yep. I think that's who. Yeah, I don't think I don't think any any radical. You know, I mean, it really is. I mean, we'll have I have a slide on the fundamentalists. You know, once you. Once you are a fundamentalist through and through, then you know there's it, it, it's there's no compromising anymore. It's it's us versus them, right. and so you know we are right and everybody else is wrong, and that's the danger of the fundamentalism. You know, right? Because people can manipulate that into doing sure. It's easy. We've seen it. Yep, multiple times. So uh, this is these are more guys that we're, we're looking. So what, what's happening, I think, in in uh, the world now, this is post post World War Two, is that they're trying to explain God. Um, and some of them are going back to, uh, you know, the ideas 
before the Holocaust in order to kind of grasp what to talk about. So this guy, Hans Joseph, he's now saying that, you know, God is, is not omnipotent. He, uh, he limits himself. Um, to, and I thought this was interesting to share the weakness of human beings. Um, but then this guy, Louis Jacobs, disagreed with Jonas and say, well, you, you know, you can't do that because you got to have cl the classic explanation that God is greater than human beings. But, but, but he thought that it's like, all right, God is just incomprehensible. So we're going back to this, 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 you know, God theory that he, there's just no way he's unknowing, you know, he's, he's not, he's so big and so great that we can't know anything, you know. Um, and then Hans Kuhn agreed with Jacobs and said that um, human beings cannot have faith in a weak God, but it, he said that it, it is the living God the strong living God who made people strong enough to pray in Auschwitz, which I thought was kind of interesting. So God at least uh, gave people strength in Auschwitz to pray. Um, then this guy, Karl Barth, was a Swiss theologian, and he rejected liberal Protestantism and natural theology. And he went back to the that the literal interpretation of the Bible. Man was flawed from the fall and we can't trust our own reason. So you gotta go to the Bible every time. So this is where things are shifting. Um, you can see kind of the splits going on. And, and, and it's interesting to me that, you know, she wrote this book in the nineties. And so what's happening in the sixties and seventies we now see in 2021 how it how the splits gotten even bigger. Um, so Tillich was saying that the personal God of tradition must go. It was dangerous to believe in a personal God who could interfere. Uh, religion is still necessary, but but I think he went back to you know God is that ultimate being. He called it ultimate concern. Um, he is fundamental to all our emotions and he pervades all of our hu human experiences. But it, I don't understand this guy. Somebody might have to say, I mean, it, it's like God is in everything, but nothing. Is, this, is that what he's saying? That it, atheism, atheism is, a, is a new theism because he's not personal. I looked at it as, you know, the Aristotle thing, you know, is he the unmover? Is he the, the, um, the this God that just kind of sits separately? Is that how you guys took Paul Tillich? Anybody want to comment on Paul Tillich? <laughs> I probably need to study him a little bit more. <laughs> she throws out a lot of philosophers. <laughs> My sense, Jane, is that he, he just experiences God as, as a, a being that's not involved with, with humanity very much. Yeah, that's kind of the Aristotle thing, isn't it? Yeah. Right. yeah. So she continued with all of these guys that were trying to were trying to go to the past to figure out who God is now. And I liked the paleontologist. <laughs> So we got this, we got this paleontologist guy that decides that uh, instead of concentrating on Jesus' humanity, Christians should focus on his cosmic portrait that were in Paul's writings. And so Jesus is this omega point. He's the climax in the evolutionary process. So Jesus is, is the point when, when God becomes all. That, so, so he is our, you know, ultimate man I guess you know from the from the evolutionary process so I thought that was kind of interesting that a, a paleontologist comes up with that well he was Same. Catholic. It's all down here from Jesus downhill after Jesus I, I guess I mean well it, it obviously is the example that we are all trying to follow so in that sense I can agree but I 
Dennis and Paul, you both were, wanted to talk. I, I, Paul, uh, he was a he was a priest. I mean, he was a Jesuit um, who who was educated in paleontology. So, I mean, I think. Okay, that's this, right. This is kind of a logical outcome that he is trying to insert uh, his religious beliefs into what he knows about the history of the earth. Yeah, that's true. That's right. He was Jesuit. I said that right there on the. <laughs> forgot about that well back you know well i guess yeah it's interesting a jesuit paleontologist i like him <laughs> okay. Dennis, did, did you have something well um charlie ann went one time the, the catholic church really i think they put a ban on his publishing his writings but later now they've kind of turned accepted that i think more so uh, after he died, uh, his some of his teachings are much more widely accepted in uh, in the world as well as in Catholicism. Well, aren't the Jesuits kind of the progressive, educated arm of Catholicism, Marilyn? Yes, yes, um, definitely. Um, you know, they're not the ones that come up with the doctrines and all of that of the church. They're the the ones that run a lot of educational institutions and encourage people to think, you know, outside the box. So I really like the Jesuits a lot. They really, they, they question, they like to question everything. I like that too. I find it, I find it fascinating that we are finding in every religion that there are groups of people that like this debate, you know, and, uh, I think that's a good thing. What do you guys think about this sentence? Scripture says God is love. It's almost like a, um, a logical reasoning problem that, that lawyers dealt with in our, in our testing. Scripture says God is love. Science progresses towards complexity and greater unity in the variety. So therefore, the unity in the differentiation is the expression of love. <laughs> I mean, I'm not quite following the logic of it, but I like it, you know, if, if science progresses towards complexity, but then greater unity within the, the varieties that we have in that complexity, maybe that's love that animates creation. So he was definitely putting a scientific spin on uh, I mean, God. I think it's certainly true in biology and Dorothy's in here, she can maybe speak to this, but I think that there's a lot of unity in the biological universe between the species. There are differences for sure, but there, that's, you know, there's reasons that we use mice and rats in the laboratory to find treatments for human conditions is because there's enough in common that, um, you know, we can do that and then make some assumptions there. I don't know, Dorothy, what do you think? She's shrugging her shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> I, I interesting that about 95 percent of what we know i can't hear you about 95 percent of what we know about human physiology is based on the study of white inbred male mice wow isn't that interesting oh my you know why they don't study female mice no they're too valuable <laughs> Well, nice. <laughs> I mean, you know, you just look at, Jane, look at the genetic code. I mean, we're hearing a lot these days about RNA and DNA. And half of the, D, half of the DNA in our bodies we share in common with the banana. He's a cousin. So, so you know, that, that's a piece of fruit, but you would never think that we have similar uh, genetic structure uh, with with a piece of fruit, and and yeah. it, as as it becomes more complex, you know, you get up to uh, some of the other uh, chimpanzees and things like that. Then you know, now you're talking about 97, 98, 99 percent in some cases. So is this how is this how love is created? <laughs> well, that's, I'm just saying that's the unity. I think that he's talking about there. Definitely the unity. It's definitely the unity. Unity and differentiation—we're all we're all different, and yet we have 
so much in common uh, at the molecular level. To me, it's hmm. that we agree to disagree, but we respect each other's opinion. And that's how we show love. All okay. right. Okay. I just, I keep getting stuck on the phrase, um, this unity is the expression of love that cre that animates creation. So it, it's almost like all of these scientific experiments and, and this, this knowledge that we have of unity in nature, that, that is what is motivating creation, you know, and maybe perhaps that's what, that's what God is, you know, that, that whenever we talk about God created the world. Ah, it's fascinating. Well, maybe maybe love is the thing that binds us all together. So that's what. Yeah. Saying. Yeah, I just really liked that. It was it was uh, an intriguing concept. So so then we get we're getting into process theology. This is Daniel Day Williams. Um, he stressed God's unity with the world and that God suffers along with us. Um, he spoke of God as the behavior of the world or an event. So this is God's unity with humanity. Um, he rejected pantheism and he also rejected that, that Greek concept of God is remote. So his, th his theology was actually trying to connect from the imbalance that had developed after Auschwitz and Hiroshima. He was trying to it, kind of explain God in a new way that um, God suffered with us, I think is what he was trying to talk about. Um, Carl Rayner is, is saying that God is the supreme mystery and Jesus is the manifestation of what humanity can become. Um, but we're now talking about transcendence of thought as, as opposed to experience. Isn't and, this, I was going to say, isn't this kind of along Greek Orthodox or Eastern Christianity about um, what I would call the, their belief in uh, hu humans becoming uh, yeah. divin divinization process? Yeah, they made the. I think the Greek Orthodox made that split very early between intellect and mysticism, and so this is yeah, this is these guys are kind of going back to um, some of the older concepts in order to try to explain the world now. You know, so um, he is saying that experience, um, unaided intellect, cannot reach the vision it seeks. That we have to, the humanity has to find a way to transcend itself, you know, and so it really is kind of that split between the mystery and the humanity. But 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 he was saying that that humanity can do it, you know. Um, and then this guy von Balthasar, isn't he? Wasn't he one of the kings, Balthasar? We should seek God in art, not logic. So he studied Dante and Bonaventura, and he's saying that these artists actually showed us God in human form. That's how good, that's how divine their art was. God is to be found by the senses and not by the cerebral and abstracted parts of the human person. So we can't do it intellectually. So it's like, whoa, Dante actually saw God. I thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> I don't know if it's true or not, but, you know, all of our art and music. I mean, I would say it more for music than art, personally, because there are certain musical um, pieces that I would say are definitely from God. You know, I mean, they just move me so much. And I think that's the concept that this guy, Balthazar, was talking about. Well, didn't, didn't she say in an earlier chapter that Dante was largely responsible for our concept of what hell is like, if there's, if there's a hell? Yeah. So, yeah. So danger in that, too. He was so detailed about it. You know, I mean, I think to this day, 
people think of the Dante's Inferno when we think of hell. You know, it's like it scares the crap out of us, you know. But yeah, there's a there's a real danger in one, you know, one man's vision becomes the world's viewpoint. I don't, yeah. But uh I don't know. I just I kind of like the concept of somebody. I, did you guys ever see that movie Amadeus, you know, where the composer is all jealous of Mozart because here's here's Mozart who's a dirty little man, but when his music came out, it was from God. <laughs> so the guy. The guy pretty much ruined him. I mean, it, it's a fictional version of Mozart, but I keep thinking of that. It's like Mozart's music is inspired from God, definitely, in my mind. Not so. fictional. Huh? This is based on history. Yes, it was based on history, but but that it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't quite that dramatic. So. Okay. I know all those guys were definitely jealous. All those guys in the Italian court were jealous of, of Mozart, but they didn't really ruin him like that. Marilyn? Jane? Yeah. I just looked up Von Baldassar, mm -hmm. and it says that he was a Catholic priest, and he was a theologian, and John Paul II actually ordained him a, a cardinal. Oh, so. Wow. Um, but then he died shortly after that. So, but I just oh. thought I would comment on that. That is interesting. Okay, it's 10, 12. I think I've got like three more. What do you want to do? Go Maybe for go, it. Go for it. Okay. Well, we can talk about, you know, obviously in every religion, they were all trying to um, find some new, some modern um viewpoints of their re re religion. So this guy Azad was talking about the symbolism, the symbolism in the Quran. And um, this, this guy Shuan was talking about the doctrine of the oneness of the being. We've already, we've seen that in the past. And then we've got uh, right before the Iranian revolution, this Dr. Al Shariate was saying that um, um, the his readers, his followers needed to create their own conception of God for, for himself or herself. And when they reached the Kaban, which is that, remember it's that box that everybody was circling around, they would realize that it was not their final destination, but a sign that 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 it, the way is not lost. It, it it shows you the direction, and it was he was pretty radical. And there are some people say that that the Shah tortured and deported him, and may have even been responsible for his assassination in 1977. So um, this was a pretty tumultuous time in Islam, and and obviously in Iran. So um, politics. There's a, there's a part where where the, she talks about how science didn't really bother the Muslim faith. They, they were able to kind of separate and the philosophers in, in um, Islam could, could figure, figure out the two, but, but politics was really, really hard <laughs> on Islam and unfortunately created the fundamentalists that we know today. So then we've got the modern Jewish that um, talked about uh, dynamic vision, a spiritual process. Um, now, these, these Jewish people, this guy Buber was talking about religion did consist of an encounter with a personal God. So they're kind of going a different direction. Um, in an endless dialogue with God, which does not endanger, endanger our freedom or, or creativity, since God never tells us what he is asking of us, we experience him as a presence and an imperative. Um, God, he, he, this guy kind of rejected the Torah a little bit. He, he was saying that God was not a lawgiver and we cannot clean up the term God, but we can take the, the stained and mauled version of God that we have right now and we can raise it from the ground and uh kind of lifted it up from our sorrow you know so but he was a rationalist but he was not opposed to myth 
And this, this is, this is all, you know, especially for the Jewish people trying to grapple with post apocalypse, you know, what do we do with religion now? So then this guy, Hersch, Heschel went the other direction. He returned to the spirit of the rabbis and the Talmud. And he thought that the, this mitzvot, this mitzvot was, was a key um, to help the Jews to, to counter the dehumanizing aspects of modernity. So we needed to go back to this depth of theology and we needed to you know, go back to the awe and the mystery of the wonder of, um, of God. And faith springs from that immediate apprehension of the sacred that you get through, through the poetry of the Bible. So he's going back into a little bit of the, of the mysticism. So Jane? Yeah. The, the mitzvah, that's, that, those are the good deeds. That's kind of going back to Rabbi Luria again, that we're helping to put the world back together with, with our good behavior toward other people. Exactly, yeah. Is that different? Is that different than mystics then, or is it? I wasn't quite sure if it, it, when he was talking about this apprehension of the sacred through poetry. That's where I went to mysticism. But yeah, the the it, it's definitely the de the good deeds thing with the mitzvah. It's the experience. Right. Yeah. It's, it, it, you know, it's just you know, it's both. Um, it's both the the belief, the faith, and the experience, as well as the good things that we can do. It's yeah. Not yeah. together. So yeah, you can see them struggling to kind of go back and, and grasp some of the concepts that have been in their history in order to find kind of a new definition of, of how to move forward in their, in their religious life. You know, I mean, it must have been really hard. Yeah, it's like when, when people have been bad to you, the, the challenge is to do something good for them. And right. Like Jesus said, you know, pray for those that have despitefully used you or um, yeah. do good unto those that have abused you and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Jane, we're out of time. Okay. I passed out. Uh, do you have more that you need to cover next Sunday? I would say maybe 10 minutes. Is that okay? okay. That sounds fine because then we'll use the rest of the time for discussion. Okay. I, hand, I handed out the discussion questions here, and I think they're going to be mailed out to everybody uh, this next in tomorrow's or today's newsletter um, for people to review in advance. 